Hey, 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 happy Wednesday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, gang, and welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, incredibly enough, GamingGang.com, which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So welcome aboard. Tonight is Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. This is live stream 890. Yowza! If you are not familiar with the show, let me point out, it is super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news. And then normally, we will take a look at a tabletop game. Every once in a while, I'll do a live review. But most of the time, it's an unboxing or a first look. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. That's right, because we are going to dive on in and take a look at the Carbon Gray role-playing game deluxe box set from Magnetic Press. And I'm going to tell you right now, this box is pretty hefty, and I do believe it is jam-packed with goodies. So we're going to have a big show tonight. Because we're going to not only take a look to see the miniatures and all the other goodies that are in this, but we're also going to page through the core rule book, which is part of this box set as well. And then we're going to take a quick peek at the Solitaire Adventure. I think it's called Badge of Blood. Yes, it is. Badge of Blood. So we'll take a peek at this as well. So once again, as I mentioned, got a big show ahead of us. So stay tuned. Speaking of staying tuned, if you are tuning in live so that you can catch the first look at the box set, let me point out, we tackled the tabletop gaming news first around here. So it's probably going to be about 35, 40 minutes before we jump on into that unboxing. So if you're watching live, kick back, relax, enjoy yourself. Hopefully, you're a subscriber to the channel, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But just, you know, be good to yourself. It's hump day. We're halfway to the weekend. So put those feet up. But, of course, if you tune in 30 minutes or more after this stream ends, there will be time stamps. So if you are impatient and you just got to get to that unboxing, you'll be able to. Those timestamps are located in the show notes, and depending on the device you might happen to be watching this on, could be right there in the timeline in front of you. So, all depends. So, I make it easy peasy, but it takes about 30 minutes before uh, I get uh, those show notes added in. So, there is that. Of course, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit GamingGang.com. For all latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. So, of course, I mentioned if you're watching live, hopefully you're a subscriber to the channel because you can take part in chat. That's right. We have chat available. It's not on screen. It's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. And you must be a subscriber to the channel for at least 48 hours before you can take part in chat. Yet another way that I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you have a question, comment, maybe you just want to say howdy, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. So first out the gate tonight in chat was Kevin R. Smith. 
He was knocking people out of the way. Get out of the way here. I'm first up. Followed by veteran Graybelox. Flaming Heron is with us from across the pond. Yes, he is one of our chat moderators, as is the Motor City Madman. Yes, the Madman himself is with us, too. And no, I'm not talking about Ted Nugent. He's no true madman. We've got the real madman here. Stray Kismet is also with us. Kabuki Kid has decided to hang with the gang tonight. So good to see Double K's in the house. Double Ham and Kathy Evans, as well as Roger Prudhomme, are here in chat. I think I've said hello to everybody. I think. If not, I'll probably catch it and be like, ooh, sorry, uh, someone so slipped in here and I forgot. All right, let's jump on into the news because I've got a nice eclectic mix tonight. Arriving in early March is Motor City. Hmm, speaking of Motor City Madman, right? Anyway, here's the latest from 25th Century Games. Motor City is a strategic roll-and-write game about running an auto plant during the heyday of Detroit. In Motor City, you have two player sheets, each with multiple areas. These areas are represented by tracks that you will mark off as you progress. Many of the tracks are interconnected with other elements in the game, giving you bonuses along the way and opportunities to unlock more points. Advancing on all of these tracks offers various amounts of points, advancements, and bonuses. The game lasts eight rounds. Each round, roll colored dice based on the number of players, then place them on spaces on the blueprint table based on value and color. Each player drafts one die and uses it. Once everyone has drafted a die twice, all players get to use the remaining die on the blueprint table. After eight rounds, you score points for your progress in engineering, assembly, testing, and more. Whoever has the most points is the winner. Motor City also has a solo mode in which you try to top your own score against an auditor that drafts dice and blocks areas of your sheet. Damn you, auditor! Its difficulty can easily be adjusted by changing the colors of dice during setup with no added rules. Motor City is for one to four players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 45 to 60 minutes, going to carry an MSRP of $30 when it arrives in stores March 8th. And I have to say, this looks very, very cool. Now, I have mentioned in the past that I, I think in some ways the roll and write genre has kind of burned out a little bit. But taking a look at this, wow, this looks pretty cool. This looks pretty cool. So one thing that I thought is interesting, which I don't believe, I, I think you can only see this on like one of the images or maybe a couple. You actually also have like on one of the sheets, there's dealerships and it looks like it's different models of cars. In fact, you can kind of see it there in the upper left portion of that sheet. Pretty nice. And I'd say $30 price tag is, uh, is pretty sweet as well. Unfortunately, I don't have any sort of really, uh, any sort of relationship with 25th Century Games. Otherwise, I would love to check this out and review it. Really, really would. All right, so there's uh, some discussion of there being some lag with the video. Let me take a quick peek. I am showing zero drop frames. So it is not coming from our end. So if there is an issue taking place, it might be, unfortunately, on YouTube side. So there is that. So Kevin says, Ted Nugent, great guitarist, average singer. I would put him a little below average on that. Wango Tango, Wango Tango. 
terrible songwriter and human being. I'm going to agree with Kevin on that one. Really, really will. <laughs> so the man that says, yeah, I agree. I'm not great with a guitar, but at least I'm a decent human being. <laughs> there you go. So uh, other people are saying, no, they're not really getting any, uh, any lag. Although uh, some folks did experience some last night. Yeah, it could be a weather thing. I don't know. Kevin says maybe it's a Midwestern thing. Disavowed92 is joining us. Welcome aboard. Good to see you once again. Let's move on to the next news piece. I am honestly, before I move on, I guess, I am really tempted to try to pick this up. I really am. Because it just, and I don't have really any interest in <laughs> cars and things like that, but it just looks like this would be really interesting. All righty. A second edition of Midnight Murder Mysteries is going to be arriving this spring from Multifaces, I should say Multifaces Editions, I believe, because this is a French company, I believe it's supposed to kind of translate to multi-sided or multi-sides editions, but it's called Multifaces. Regardless, here's the scoop on the game. Midnight. Time of the murder. Welcome to a story-based crime investigation game on a cruise ship. Aboard the Majestic, the lifeless body of a passenger has been found in their luxury suite. You are attending a conference on board with other private detectives and place a wager to reconstruct the circumstances of the alleged crime before the ship arrives. At port, who did it? What was their motive? What was their modus operandi? Discover the story piece by piece and try to understand what happened. In each of the 27 unique cases, you can interrogate 12 suspects on three conversation topics and search for clues at 24 locations on various decks. With 60 possible paths to follow in each case, you won't have time to explore them all. Be efficient in your investigations and avoid false paths. There are three possible game modes. In Midnight Murder Mysteries, each case can be played competitively, cooperatively, or even solo. When you start a game, choose how you'll be playing it this time. In competitive mode for two to five players, players compete to solve the case and decide if their information is made public or not. In cooperative mode, also for two to five players, players investigate on their own but share their findings when they reach conclusions. In solo mode for one or two players, the player competes with a crew member to solve the case. Midnight Murder Mysteries Second Edition is for one to five players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 60 to 90 minutes per case, and will carry an MSRP of $65 when it docks in stores sometime during Q2. Interesting. Of course, we know who the murderer is right off the bat. We know that this is a convention of private investigators. So, obviously enough, it is Jessica Fletcher, the famed serial killer. So, yep. Yep, yeah, from the TV show Murder She Committed. Yes, that is, that is it. It's Jessica Fletcher. <laughs> this looks pretty neat. It really, really does. I like the uh, the components look pretty cool as well. So very nice, very nice. Let's talk about some role playing game news because there is still time to take advantage of the God Bound Bundle of Holding. I've got the deets on the deal. Hero, we've resurrected our April 2020 Godbound bundle featuring, you guessed it, Godbound, Kevin Crawford's tabletop fantasy role-playing game of heroic demigods forging a new world with the uncreated knight. The throne of heaven stands empty and a pantheon of mortals newly bound to the words of creation 
faces a land ravaged by madmen and fools. Godbound characters start play as legendary powers, facing fearsome god monsters, legions of sorcerers, and bitter angels. And using the system-neutral tools like those in Kevin's Stars Without Number, a game master can create noble courts, lost shards of heaven, and terrifying foes worthy of these exalted heroes. This revival helps promote the Kickstarter campaign that's currently in progress for Godbound designer Kevin Crawford's new cyberpunk science fiction role-playing game, Cities Without Number, which we have discussed in the past, which promises more of the game mastering tools that make Kevin's games widely popular. This comprehensive revival once again brings you the entire Godbound line for an unbeatable bargain price. For just $5.95, you'll get both titles in this revived offer's starter collection, which has a retail value of $25, as DRM-free PDFs. And it includes the complete 214-page Godbound Deluxe Edition Core Rulebook and the introductory adventure, Ten Buried Blades. And if you pay more than the current threshold price of $17, and 28 cents. You'll level up and also get this revival's entire bonus collection with four more titles worth an additional $38, including Lexicon of the Throne, New Words of Creation and Rules for Creating Religions, and Kalia, The Broken Towers, which is a gazetteer, and 16 Sorrows, a handbook of dire calamities, plus a full-length adventure, Storms of Yashau, something along those lines. These savings run through March 1st and 10% of your payment after gateway fees will be donated to the Benzi Food Partners, a nonprofit Feeding America food bank serving Kevin Crawford's home county in Honor, Michigan. Nice. So I always had the impression, and I might be wrong, but I always had the impression that Godbound is so I guess was inspired by Exalted, which is now I think is Onyx. Yeah, I think it's Onyx Path Publishing. And for some reason, that's that's how I've always kind of gotten the vibe of, of it. In fact, they even mention Exalted in the uh, sell sheet info. So kind of curious. But once again, it's Kevin Crawford, so you know you are going to be able to uh, utilize a lot of tables to just create your own game world. So, pretty sweet. Anyway, uh, Kabuki Kid said that she was going to, she was going to type in murder she committed. Lady Heron says, wherever Jessica Fletcher is, you never want to vacation there. Yeah, that's always been that running joke, right? That it's really Angela Lansbury is the killer. That's why everywhere she goes, somebody's murdered. And then she just pins it on somebody else. Moving right along. Currently up for crowdfunding for author Jessica Markram is a new physical edition of the rules light vampire role-playing game, Oops! All Draculas. Here's the skinny. Oops! All Draculas was created for Dracula Jam 2021 and one of the first games to use the buddy system, emphasizing teamwork and found family. Sometimes called a what-we-do-in-the-shadows simulator, Oops! All Draculas is a tabletop role-playing game that can be as silly or as dark as you choose. Oops All Draculas is a D6 dice pool game using either Tarot or Dracula by Bram Stoker as your favorite Dracula book. Do you live your best Dracula life? And can be played with or without a Dracula master. Well, there's your DM. In it, you play as various styles of Dracula, all living together in a home of your design. Whether from internal or external forces, shenanigans ensue. 
Be they Dracula hunters, new Draculas in town, werewolves, or the hated home ownership association. Damn that HOA. Dracula's life is never easy. Choose your Dracula archetype and assign statistics to your Dracula abilities. Choose your familiar and then create your home as a group. Whenever you come up against something that requires rolling, if something is uncertain, roll as many D6s as you have in the relevant statistic. Fives and sixes are successes. If a fellow Drac if a fellow, I should say, Dracula helps you, add a D6 for each helper. If your familiar can help, you get to add a D6 for them as well. Lastly, if you're rolling well in your home, yep, you guessed it, that's an additional D6. Beware of magical backfire, however, things can go very wrong when too many Draculas put their magic together. Good luck, and don't suck it up. The Crowdfunder Project, yes, that is the web address I am sharing right there, for Oops! All Draculas is past the 60% funding mark, and you can reserve a copy of the game in PDF for a $15 pledge, or you can score the physical book, which I believe is going to be a hardcover, for a $25 pledge through March 16th. So quite a ways to go. This looks like this will easily fund. Expected delivery for the PDFs would be April, and the physical book should follow in June. So there is that. Pretty quick turnaround. I believe the game is, is effectively done. It's designed. I, I know there are some stretch goals that are available for it, which will add to the page count. But the, the game itself and much of the artwork, I do believe, is complete. So this is good to go. Kabuki Kid says, that's some title. So it sounds a hair like Storyteller, but with D6s instead of D10s. I would take a guess. That, like I said, this is supposed to be very rules light. And I got to say, I'm a huge fan of what we do in the shadows. Both editions. Plus, Wellington Paranormal, if you happen to watch that as well. So uh, this could be fun. This could be fun. You Like it points out early on in that uh, information, you can make it silly or you can make it serious. It's all up to you. Or you could actually make it a blend of both. Kind of like what we do in the shadows. All right, my final news piece. Arriving next week from Arts Hellsorian Games is the Black Chrome Sourcebook for Cyberpunk Red. And I've got the dope. Back in 1991, Ardell Saurian published Chromebook, a catalog of gear, weapons, vehicles, fashion, cyberware, and more for the classic cyberpunk 2020, and it became one of the hallmarks of the line, representing the very concept of style over substance. How could Ardell Saurian do any different with Cyberpunk Red? A supplement, I should say, a supplement, I need a sip here. My stick, my, it's like my lips are sticking together. It is a supplement for Cyberpunk Red. Still cyber, still punk. It's a gorgeous book full of beautiful illustrations. Almost every item in the book is accompanied by art to show what it looks like in the world of cyberpunk. There's also lore that ties into cyberpunk 2077 and the hit anime series Cyberpunk Edge Runners. Black Chrome brings the classic in world gear book forward to the modern day and expands on the economic conditions of Night City in 2045. It includes over 170 items to make you even more cyberpunk, including new apps, gear, linear frames, weapons, cyberware, vehicles fashion, and armor. There's new lore about the megacorps and neocorps trying to claw their way back to the top of the hill. The lesson on economics in the time of the red. Oh, that's uh, the 
sound that exciting? All right, everybody, gather around. A little lesson on economics, everybody. I'm sure it's fine. There's also six night markets and the dangerous fixers who run them. This 168-page hardcover is going to carry an MSRP of $40. Or you can grab the PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG for $20. Beginning February 27th is not out yet. Got to wait till February 27th. Kabuki Kid says, like Uncle Albert's guide, but for cyberpunk? Yes, the old Car Wars catalogs that uh, used to come out all the time. Sweet. So very nice. Always good to see our Talsorian games continuing to release cyberpunk titles out there. Uh, they've been they've been releasing uh, stuff for The Witcher as well. So that's cool to see. So once again, Black Chrome is going to arrive next week. Just about 92 says Uncle Albert's guide is awesome. Oh, yeah, we used to pick up everything for Car Wars. That's why when I talk about how, you know, Steve Jackson games and I don't get along, I, it's, it's upsetting. It's, I, I'm sad about it because of how much stuff we used to get from Steve Jackson games to how much we actually loved the company. <laughs> so it's like, oh, well. But yeah, we, you know, the funny thing is, I, I wonder how many people out there are like this as well. You know, if, if you've been gaming for a long time, uh, playing Car Wars, we seem to spend more time designing vehicles, you know, motorcycles, cars, uh, semi trucks, than we actually did playing the game. And I think, I think that was the case with a lot of people so yeah but uh yeah we used to we used to have some fun i always joke about how you'd play for like three or four hours and the actual in-game time that had uh you know passed was was like 25 seconds <laughs> so it's like the spot 92 says way more time Making cars, then blowing them up. K Kabuki Kid says, oh, yes. I spend much more time designing cars than actually playing. That was half the fun. There were a few, a handful, maybe two. There were, I remember there were two adventures that came out that you could play solo. But, of course, playing solo, you also had to control everybody else's vehicles. Kabuki Kid says the Uncle Al Albert's catalog from hell was the ultimate collection. It had all the guides compiled in it, and it was impossible to get for years. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall having that. Maybe I did. I don't know. But, I mean, we had just tons, tons of Car Wars stuff. All right, that is it for the news tonight. Of course, I was talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget, the gaming gang, thus the Dispatch, is affiliated with the One Bookshelf site. So if you're going to visit drive through RPG, please stop by thegaminggang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. All those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do help to keep thegaminggang.com around. Also, if you like this video, if you dig the channel, if you find thegaminggang.com to be a valuable resource, hell, if you just like what we do, you can always stop on by paypal.me slash thegaminggang and making a small donation. And big thank you to all of you out there who do use our banner ads and or stop by paypal.me. It is certainly appreciated a ton. Uh, Keldon is with us in chat. Welcome aboard. This about 92 says Gaslands is good also. 
would have hundreds of hours in Car Wars and always gravitated back to it. Uh, the original Gaslands, I have not seen the second edition, uh, really, really felt like Car Wars, but as a miniatures game. So, And of course, Car Wars itself was super easy to just port over as a miniatures game. In fact, they sold miniatures for it for quite a while. Coco B has swung on in as well. So we're going to dive on into the unboxing of the deluxe edition of the Carbon Gray role-playing game in just a few moments. First, I did want to mention, uh, I've had a few people comment as well as uh, gotten some emails from folks asking about my review of Dungeons & Dragons Keys from the Golden Vault. And they're kind of curious. My review is relatively negative. And they said it's, it's kind of surprising because many of the reviews they've seen have been overly positive. And my response to that, and I'm not taking any other outlet out to the woodshed or anything like that, right? But my response is, you got to look at who's doing the review. So I have found, in my experience, outlets that have a relationship with a particular system or game company will have far more positive reviews for those releases than someone who does not. So there is that. Also, and I am not going to name the outlet, but I was really surprised by this because people <clears throat> sent links to some other reviews and they're like, nobody brings up, you know, some of the things that you brought up. So I checked out one of the reviews, which is a positive review for the adventure book. And the reviewer, in the first three minutes of the review, and it is a review, it is a review, it is mentioned in the title that it is a review. In the first three minutes, the reviewer says they did not read the book. They had skimmed through it. How can you review a role-playing game release without actually reading the book? That is beyond me. That is absolutely beyond me. Now, you could talk about what you ran across, right? You know, we, we do first looks at stuff. We're going to do a first look tonight. It's not a review. And a lot of times when people refer to my page-throughs as a review, I always point out, I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. Not a review. It's just a first look. Nothing says it's a review. Kabuki Kid says, oh, wow, reviewing a book without reading it? That's insane. And extra funny that they fully admitted to that in the video. They did. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So what I'm trying to say is I have no affiliation with anybody. Now, I have friends in the industry, and there are companies that there are people who work there who I consider to be good friends in the industry. But I am not beholden to anyone. So I share what I think. Now, I pointed out, in, especially in D&D &D videos, because some people get really bent out of shape when I don't just absolutely love the latest D&D &D release. But I tell people what I think. So, because I've said this many times before, if Wizards of the Coast suddenly decided, hey, you know what? We're not sending this guy's stuff anymore. It's not like that would be the end of the channel. Same thing with companies like Cubicle 7 Entertainment, Free League Publishing, 
all all these Paizo. I just got the latest releases for the month from Paizo. Once again, if if any of these companies were to cut me off and be like, oh, that's it, we're done with Jeff. It would not be the death knell of the gaming game. Now, if something happened, I got canceled. <laughs> Then that would probably be the death knell. <laughs> but uh you know. I what I, I don't know what to tell people. You know, it's not like I'm super, super critical about stuff, but you know, I you know, I, I happen to be a big proponent of playability, uh a usability at the table. So that comes into play. Uh, a good amount as well. And I think it was Kevin today had actually commented on the review. And I had mentioned one of the, one of the big things that led to, well, I gave it five out of 10. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, this is just hot trash. Cause that'd be like a two or a three, one, zero. I did give it a five out of 10, but I mentioned one of the biggest reasons why I, I skewed negatively with my review of Keys from the Golden Vault is that Wizards of the Coast and Chris Perkins, and somebody else had commented, oh, well, you shouldn't be so hard on Chris Perkins. Hey, the guy's the lead designer. I don't know what to tell you. If his name is on the product as the lead designer, then... The buck has to stop with him. And somebody was like, oh, you know, he's he's overseeing all these different things and he's pulled in all these different directions. Those are just excuses. Those are excuses for a lackluster product. So, and I, I don't know Chris Perkins at all. I'm sure he's a very nice person. I, you know, I don't have anything against him. It's just, you know... You're the lead designer on a project. Who am I gonna who am I gonna talk about, you know, when it's like something that's not all that great? Anyway, so I said that m one of my big issues was Wizards of the Coast and Chris Perkins were just constantly hyping Keys from the Golden Vault as Ocean's Eleven meets. D and D, it's like, oh, you're gonna feel like you're playing in a heist movie, and you don't, you do not, not at all. So it's, in fact, uh, I think Kevin even mentioned this. He said that uh, all they, you know, it's a few paragraphs. Oh, I actually just shared that in chat. Just a few paragraphs devoted to how to play a heist game, and that's it. It's like all the work has to be thrown in the lap of the dungeon master as far as Wizards of the Coast. That's how they operate now. And we also see all the time now Wizards of the Coast promotes a product. Oh, oh wow, we're going to have these new races in it. Oh, you should be excited. Oh, my gosh. And then you, you see the product, and it's like, that new race has all of four paragraphs devoted to it. It's like, what is that? Kabuki Kid says they feel like Wizards needs to clean house. They need to shake things up. They certainly do. Uh, I've actually considered doing a video talking about, uh, I guess I would ask the question, can Dungeons & Dragons recapture the wonder of... Dungeons and Dragons. And I don't know if they can. I really don't. I really don't know if they can or not. Because the companies out there were releasing products that would be really exciting for game masters and players at their tables that are, you know, based on the 5e mechanics. They're not coming from Wizards of the Coast. That is for sure. Digital Janitor is with us. I believe this might be a first-time visit from DJ. So welcome aboard. Thank you very much 
for sw swinging on in. So the madman says, once I heard they hadn't read the book, I would have quit watching. I think I watched about another, another minute. And that was it. Uh, so Flaming Heron says, like IGN, who do reviews for games without playing them. Yes, just like it. Here's something else, and, and we're going to jump into that unboxing and just real quick. I'm not going to, you know, harp on this too much. Something else I notice is you're, you're seeing a lot of outlets out there that have, they, they've traditionally never had anything to do with our hobby who are now in the business of reviewing stuff. So, whoops, there was a, a review of... I want to say it, it's the new D&D book, and it's from Screen Rant. Seriously? Screen Rant. It's like, yep, anything to get those clicks, baby. And, of course, they thought it, it was just fantastic. They, Oh, my gosh, it was just so good. But they never told you why it was so good. All they did was rehash little plot synopsises of some of the adventures. That was their review. See a lot of that going on, too, with these, uh, oh, wow, this is, this, is, this is the best D&D &D release since the last D&D &D release. <laughs> Digital Janitor says that they've moved on to Pathfinder. Yeah. I will be sharing a look at this month's uh, Pathfinder and Starfinder releases. Should be tomorrow. I'll probably shoot it tomorrow because those are usually pretty, pretty quick. Liquid Nebula says, Screen Rant, they're so bad at their clickbait. Yeah, it's weird. I, you know, it's kind of funny. I'll sit there and I'll, like, scroll through my like feed on my phone and they just throw so much shit in there where it's like, why are you, why are you sharing this? And it's sort of like, you know, God forbid Google would actually include the gaming gang as a news source. I have tried multiple times and it always, they always turn me down and it's sort of like, hate to break it to you guys, but, uh, we're far more of a news source than a lot of these outlets you share their their game reviews and things like that. So, down now. All righty. So we are going to be taking a look at Carbon Gray in just a few moments. But first, I think it's time for a brief intermission. It's intermission time, folks. Time out for a delicious snack in our sparkling refreshment building. Every item a fresh, appetizing taste treat. Nature take its own sweet time. Make it Rainier for life.
Let's go up to the surface for some Wilkins coffee. I'll never touch the stuff. Oh. You should. It's a whale of a coffee. The trucks, the trucks are rolling. The great big trucks are rolling. And you are the man controlling the big new Johnny Express. Turn right, turn left, and watch a go. Put her in reverse and drive her slow. Even hitch up by remote control with a big new Johnny Express. Yes, get cab and trailer first. Then dump truck. It really works. Just watch. Troop carrier. Drive it across a bridge you build. It even fires shells. Then look. In seconds, you make it a tank truck. Change it yourself and fill it from your storage tank. Load cargo with giant crane. Moving conveyor and forklift really works. Tire kit. Raise the jack and change the tire. Get cab and trailer. So strong you can even stand on it. Then all these trucks you drive by remote control. With a big new Johnny Express. Remember, get Johnny Express by Tupper. So what do you want on your tombstone? And as Kevin had mentioned that ad, yes, tombstone pizza is still around. And there once was a time, oh, maybe about eight, nine years ago, that tombstone pizza was a halfway decent frozen pizza and pretty inexpensive. Nowadays, I have not had one in a few years. Last time I had one, it was hot garbage. It was awful. Just awful. But, uh, actually, I should mention, if you, uh, I, I don't know if it's a Midwest thing or not, there is a relatively new frozen pizza out there called Lots of Matzah. And, I've seen it sometimes at Walmarts. We have Jewel here. Jewel Osco is kind of like our local grocery store. They carry it. It's actually pretty damn good. It's like a pub pizza. So if uh, any of you out there have ever had pub pizza, it is, it is pretty good. It's actually my favorite frozen pizza now. It is not inexpensive, but... Kevin says, DiGiorno is awesome. DiGiorno's not bad. DiGiorno's not bad. In fact, we just had, in fact, Kabuki Kid mentioned this, the DiGiorno Thin Crust. I had a Thin Crust from them that was really good. And it was, I was like, wow, this is pretty close to, you know, a Thin Crust pizza. Because usually it's just like cardboard for most of the, frozen pizzas out there and yes wilkins is not responsible for the death of lonkins this time although yes he did place him in danger and distracted him with that coffee talk so this about 92 says best pizza in the big windy DiGiorno pizza no no i'm saying we're, we're talking frozen pizza we're not talking you know, pizza, pizza. But, you know, every once in a while, it's sort of like, you know, you don't want to blow 25 bucks on a 14-inch pizza. <laughs> so, all righty then. So, tonight, we are going to dive on in and take a look at the Carbon Gray role-playing game deluxe box set from Magnetic Press. And I believe Magnetic Press is actually like a book publisher. I think they do a lot of graphic novels in that. And now they have a, a game division, I believe. So Carbon Gray, the role-playing game, is written by Andrew E.C. Gaska, who we should recognize from the Alien role-playing game. Or I guess I should say Alien the role-playing game from Free League Publishing, as well as E.L. Thomas, with artwork provided by Hoang Nguyen, uh, Carrie Evans, and Kinson Lowe. This ad 
The Lux Edition box set we're going to be taking a look at here carries an MSRP of $149.99. If you want to just get the core book in hardcover, it carries an MSRP of $39.99, or you can grab just the PDF alone over at Drive Through RPG for $20. There is a primer that is available. It is it's either pay what you want or free over at drive through RPG. Got to be honest, I don't know if it's just the setting primer or if it is a quick start. But there are actually a few releases out there for Carbon Gray. And we'll swing on over to the other camera because here I've got the box set. So, I uh, who just popped in and said, uh, oh, there you go, Kabuki Kid, talking about they like the cover art. I don't believe I said hello to Shaz. Shaz is with us in chat. Madman says they have a really bad connection on their end. Going to have to drop it and watch the first look later. Good to see you, Madman. We'll catch you again next week. All right, so let's take a look at the back here. Where lies your destiny? Experience a turbulent, dystopian, diesel punk world at war in this fast-paced action role-playing game based on the hit graphic novel series by Hoang Nguyen. Survive the grimness of trench warfare. Dare to soar the deadly skies. Master the art of espionage to uncover the secrets of your enemies. Navigate the social hierarchy and underhanded dealings of both the nobility and the underworld. Discover and learn to manipulate the strange powers that affect the very fabric of reality. Built on the official magnetic variant D6MV of the classic D6 system role-playing game rules created by West End Games, Carbon Gray is the perfect introduction for new players to experience tabletop role-playing with its accessibility and ease of play. That's right. That's why you see the West End Games trade dress, which I was actually very surprised to see. All right, let's get rid of this shrink wrap. I'll be the first to point out I know absolutely nothing about this setting. I I believe that there is a... It's, I don't think it's a graphic novel. I think it's an omnibus which collects uh, multiple graphic novels. I think there's an omnibus available that collects all of the... Uh, graphic novels, comics, basically. All right, so it looks like we've got some punch boards here. It looks like we've got some trenches. We've got, looks like, a map. And we've got minis. We've got dice. We've got cards. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, we're going to take a look at the miniatures in here. And we'll look at all the other goodies. And then the last thing we'll take a peek at is the book. Because then what I'll do is I'll actually change the focus on our camera that's overhead, the good old panty boy, uh, so we can lock in the focus as we take a peek at the book. All right, so got to say the plastic insert is decent. Uh, kind of thin. See, there's our core rule book right there that we'll take a look at in just a bit. Let's just move that off to the side. I do like the plastic cover here. Oh, so I see we've got some tape. Oh, come on. Oh, I'll just use the hobby knife. Yep. I don't want to tear the, the box. All right, so I know we've got this big, this is like a 96 millimeter, almost like a mech. I don't know if I've got this on correct or not, but closer look at this that is 
pretty cool. And as we can see, it's German. So my understanding is that this is like an alternate universe. This is kind of a, uh, a European setting, but it's not our world. And there's monsters as well as, of course, soldiers and things like that. And as I'd already mentioned, this is a diesel punk setting. This is, this is very cool. So Kevin uh, points out, makes you wonder if Magnetic Play Press bought West End Games trademarks or other IP. I mean, I noticed they say they're using the D6 system, not Open D6. Uh, one thing I should point out, it is actually Magnetic Press. I double-checked. I think they just put the play on there to designate their game division, but I, the game division's not called Magnetic Play Press, and that is coming from my PR person who told me that. Because I was like, yeah, I want to make sure that I don't uh, call the company by the wrong name. So Digital Janitor says, yeah, that looks cool. Be fun painting that. Yeah, the, the detail is really nice. And it is not soft plastic either. So that's one of the things that kind of irritates me a lot of times. Taking a look at some uh, some miniatures from time to time, usually for role-playing games. And it's the fact that uh, the, the plastic's real soft. Okay, so then we've got a wolf. Although that looks like a pretty monstrous wolf. Now, there are some duplicates in here for it looks like they're soldiers. So there is the wolf. Looks like this is a character here. If I can get it out of there, there we go. So these are supposed to be 35 millimeter. So they are a little bit larger. Because nowadays your standard is 32. I remember back in the day when you were looking at like 24s, 28. You'd have companies that were like, oh, yeah, that's a 28 millimeter mini. And it was like, no way. No way it is. Right. So there are three of these troopers. Try to get a little closer in there, give you a better look. Definitely like the style. It's pretty cool. I'm liking that. Okay, so we've got three of those. Looks like we've got a commander of some sort. With his cloak whipping in the wind. And that thing must <laughs> drag behind him seriously. <laughs> Flaming Huron points out, these are interesting looking minis. Yeah, they certainly are. And they have hex bases. Yeah, because it looked like the uh, punch boards that we saw for like where the, the trenches looked like they were uh, actually hexes. They were hex maps. All right, so then we have, it's like a noble woman with a pistol. That. So then we've got three troopers who look like Brits. All right, come on, autofocus, pick it up. Come on, panty boy. There we go. Kind of look like Doughboys, too. 
Although the reality is the uh, the Allies all kind of well outside the French kind of had the same sort of helmets. The Brits and the Americans. So we've got three of those. Uh, it's like some sort of, it's like a spy. She's uh, she's got a hood. I think these are some of the characters from the graphic novels. Let's see what we've got here. Somebody with a sword. And not sure what that is on their back. They're kind of dragging this sword. So it looks like we've got five minis left. So, it's like another female character. Putting their hand up like to stop somebody. You know, that looks pretty small for being the 35 millimeter figure. Just as I'm I'm just eyeballing it, of course. Then again, it might supposed to be a kid. You know, I don't know. So they would be smaller. All right, so here's somebody. She has, looks like an automatic rifle and a sword. And looks like they might be wearing one of those those Kaiser helmets there. Kabuki Kid says, I sort of assume that might be a child or something. Yeah, so Kabuki Kid said, yeah, it looked like it was a submachine gun and a sword. Fleming Heron says, maybe they're just a really short person. That's a possibility too. All right, so this looks like this might be another noble. Oh, maybe not. It's like some, <laughs> maybe they're a flyer. That's a possibility here because their, their scarf looks to be kind of like whipping in the wind. All right. And then here's our uh, last figure. Then we got a trio of, come here, come on. These are not the easiest to, to get out of the, the little insert. Uh, this looks like another noble. <laughs> it says it's windy on that battlefield. I was going to say, we've got a trio of other minis. Uh, they're fairly large. I think they're monsters. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'll show you what these look like in a sec. It's pretty wild. So they're they're pretty big, and they're uh, like leaping with a battle axe. They look kind of monstrous. And to kind of give you an idea, size comparison here. So, pretty wild. So there are three of these in the box. And we got our dice, or six-sided dice. 
and look like we've got Roman numerals on them. There's actually pretty cool dice. So our ones have this little symbol on it. I know we have, we're supposed to have a couple of like wild dice. I bet you they're these. So we've got five of these two colors. And then we've got those two. Like I said, I think these are supposed to be the wild dice. Because, uh, like, I think reality is like in a state of flux or something like that. And then we've got a bunch of cards. Might as well take a peek at these. Won't look at everything, all the cards, but just kind of get an idea. They're supposed to be, I think, I think the box said 140. Okay, so it looks like we've got, oh, wow, this is kind of cool. So these are, these look like NPC cards. So we've got stat blocks on the back. So this is a purge trooper. So we get our stat block and then the art on the front. And we have like multiple copies of some of these. So Sawbones. That is an archetype. Sardonic Sapper. I guess that's going to be an archetype. Yep. Royal Operative. Uh, that's our figure with the submachine gun and sword. The Reluctant, I should say, Reluctant Mentor. The Moonlighter. The master spy, the learned scholar, the hawk-eyed sharpshooter, the grease monkey. Uh, that is our little figure, I think. The free lady slash lord. The Fervent Revolutionary. A Fenris Wolf. That is an archetype. Okay. Faithful Sentinel. Uh, dragon. Oh, I'm sorry. A Dragoon. I didn't see the second O. I was like, Dragon? What? I, that doesn't look like anything to have to do with a dragon. It's like, yes, it's a Dragoon. Dissenting apostates. They're all archetypes that you can play, no doubt. A Darman Adept. A devil Dog. Brash Dog Fighter. Fleming Heron says, the wolf is a character then? Maybe. A uh, Cavalry Scout. Still archetypes. Aspiring Occultist. Assassin. Somebody looks pissed. <laughs> the spy. That's the second spy we've had. A sniper. Mad scientist. <laughs> Entitled Blue Blood. What was that? Manipulative noble. Mechanic. Tanker. All right now we start getting into foes. So this is where we'll see some multiples here. So we've got gunners, heavy infantry, infantry officer, more infantry, green recruit, fearless ace. But he doesn't have a scarf whipping around. Sky jockey. This is, uh, this is very cool so far. Tough. A hitman. All right, so those are from this deck, and it looks like we have even more 
in this deck. So I think this might have some gear in it as well because it shows a landing craft. So we have some more shock troopers, trench fighters, uh, I guess important NPCs, Giselle Gray. The Wolf General. For a second, I thought it might be a wolf. I thought, maybe. The Pit Viper, another beast. War Dog. Okay, so let's just take a look at them. We got Landing Craft, a few of those. Hot Air Balloons. Dart Fighter. Floating Fortress. An Airship. A War Bomber. Warplane, armored car. So it's kind of kind of interesting how some of the technology looks like it is World War One era, and then other things look uh, much more like the 1930s or 40s. So we've got the tanks. Ooh, then we start getting into monsters. Spectre, Merching Dead. Oh, great. So we've got the undead in this, too, huh? Dragon Wraith Hydra. A Dragon Wraith. Oh, there's another wolf. Warmount Horse. A War Dog or Dog. Bird of Prey. Wow, there's lots in here. That is for sure. Okay, so this is our insert here. All right, why is this not something else under there? No, that's kind of weird. So it looks like it's cut well enough to let them sit down in there. Maybe it's not. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a tight squeeze. All right. And then should go in like so. So these are all the minis and everything. Now, let's jump on in. And we are going to take a look at the core book. Well, actually, you know what? We've still got some punch boards now. Let's take a peek at those. So here we've got, look at this. We've got a Game Master screen. So it is a landscape Game Master screen. I got to admit, for your $149.99, you are getting quite a bit. So Digital Janitor says they're digging the artwork. That is the GM screen. And I believe we got a map here. It's just uh, paper. This is our U European map. And, ah, okay, see? See, we've got the hexes here, so this is just a play mat. Oh, there's some trenches here. Fold this back up. Then we will take a look at the punch boards. And then we will dive on into the rule book. So I'm sure we've got tokens. Looks like we've got some terrain features as well. All right, so we've got trenches. And if you notice, I'll try to catch some glare on this, that the way these pieces are made or so you can connect them in different ways. There we go. So 
see? It's kind of wild. So we've got that dual sided. Uh, decent thickness. They're not real thick, but not too bad. Kabuki Kid asks, what is the MSRP? When he and said, if ever in doubt, Jeff puts it in the description of all his videos. I do. I, I always do that. $149.99 for this box set. And this just came out, as far as I know. Looks like we got some more trenches here and here. Then it looks like we've got, looks like these are just soldiers from each of the sides. Uh, I believe we got some of the characters here that we've taken a look at. It's like uh, if they're knocked out of action. Uh, some terrain features. It's like we've got a machine gun. And then what, poison gas, maybe? Flames. It's cool. Very nice. All right. So. Uh, I guess that's going to be last. I'm just going to put these back in the box. But uh, it looks the way it's designed is the core book is the last thing to go into the box. All right. So. I used to pick up tons of stuff from West End Games. I still think that West End Games made the best Star Wars role-playing game. I will be the first to admit that I have not really delved into the, well, it used to be Fantasy Flight, their Star Wars. But, I mean, West End Games was just phenomenal. All right, so here we got the hardcover core book. Now, you can pick up just the core book alone for $39.99. So, Keep in mind, we're not going to look at each and every page, but let's get an idea of what we are looking at. So, and look, we've got rounded corners on the pages. That's, that's unusual. That's a little different. So we've got the world of carbon gray, skills and attributes, character creation, combat and recovery, gear and weapons, vehicle rules, a world at war, running in the game, allies, enemies, and extras, episodes, so we may actually have some introductory adventures in here. Archetype templates and character registration form. Taking a guess, that is going to be our character sheet. So Kabuki Kid mentions how the Star Wars role-playing game helped fuel the novels that followed and expanded the universe. Yeah, I know. It's just amazing. So, Flaming Heron says, can't compare the FFG one to West End Games version, but it's fairly intuitive despite the investment required to buy the books if you play a specific character. Well, I didn't say that the FFG Star Wars isn't good. I'm just, I've heard really good things about it. So, here we got the world. And, of course, keep in mind, I'm going to skip through uh, a lot of pages here. We're not going to look at each and every page. A big thank you to the fine folks over at Magnetic Press for providing this review copy. So here are our archetypes. So we saw those archetypes. So we get a little bit of a breakdown of what they are. I got to say... The artwork that we have seen is just really, really, really nice. Has a little bit of a, a uh, manga feel to it. A little bit. So we've got our skills. Now, it doesn't look like we've got tons of skills. So if I remember correctly, 
I, it's been a long time, I got to say. For the D6 system, it was a dice pool. And I, if I remember right, I thought you totaled up your dice to get your total. And you needed to meet or exceed. Uh, it's not, it's not like say, the Mutineer Zero system or you know the Year Zero engine. Here's our character creation. Select template. Be who you want to be. Skills. You have your template now. It's time to buy skills, hero points, starting equipment, your persona. So you're going to have quirks, obligations. Remarkable abilities. I'm going to take a stab that this is probably going to be fairly rules light. Now, I had heard through the grapevine that the actual game setting isn't as baked into this system as you would see in other sort of like licensed role-playing games because keeping in mind this is based on an, an IP this is not an original setting for a role-playing game so we've got initiative so we're getting into our combat Now, see, we've got, like, range bands here. So, attacking, we've got melee and ranged attacks. And then every character has three defenses. A surprise defense, a ready defense, and a psyche defense. First two are for avoiding physical attacks. And the third is for mental attacks, no doubt. And of course, you're only going to use D6s. It looks like we've got a few pages devoted to combat. I'd be kind of curious uh, how they uh, tackle like mass combat. Seeing that, you know, we've got trenches, <laughs> soldiers, and things like that. So Flaming Heron says that uh, from what they've seen of this, they really do like it, but they haven't actually read through the entire PDF yet. Here's our gears and gear and weapons. Gears, duh. It's gear, Jeff. Got our weapon stats. Oh, so we actually do have some specific kind of firearms because here I saw we've got like pistol rifle but then here we have highborn defender 25 a uh, caliber the shot and core whisper fire machine pistol <laughs> the Bronson and Bean Brigadier Tommy gun submachine gun Archaic ranged weapons, black powder pistols, muskets, bows, slings, javelins. We've got vehicle rules. There we go. There's an armored car. And of course, because we've got the deluxe set, we also have the cards that give us all the stat blocks making it very convenient for the DM. So instead of, instead of Fokker, we have Vocker. <laughs> and we've got some various tanks. Oh, and then we've got kind of our mechs or at least, or like we saw the, uh, it's the 
Cannon, Cannonin Lover. <laughs> Kabuki Kid says that uh, they're impressed by what they've seen. Quantum Face Dragon says, yeah, okay, I'll be needing to buy this now, too. <laughs> like, thanks a lot. Yeah, what can I tell you? What can I tell you? <laughs> All right, the world at war. Great war is the inevitable outcome of the Western world, the product of long-lived nations that have flourished and fallen, nations that have both conquered and surrendered, and nations whose time of reckoning have at last come. The road to the Great War was traveled for centuries. All right, so then we've got our map once again. Kingdom of Lions. So that's, that's our England, huh? The Kingdom of Lions. So we've got allies and axis. I am intrigued. Certainly am. I'm actually curious to check out the, uh, yeah, there you go. Flipping around says, meet the Valkers. <laughs> Kelvin asks, what is the primary mechanic? Did you say you roll for successes or add up the dice pool? Uh, we'll take a peek. Because I don't think it's successes. I think, I think you're totaling up your dice. That's how I seem to remember. So, okay, running the game. Let's see if we get it in here. I don't, I don't think. I think we would get that earlier. Okay, it's more like game master facing stuff. To see what we get. All right, we'll go back. We can take a peek early up. Kevin says, Yeah, you add up the dice. That's what I thought. That's how I thought uh, the D6 system worked. Was that you add up your dice. And depending on what you're trying to do, you, you kind of have like a challenge number to overcome. And then I think in combat, you're looking to try to overcome the defense number of your target. So you got some supernatural creatures here, the stone demon, the Fenris wolf, you got those wraiths, the dragon wraith and the dragon wraith hydra. Episodes. There are some episodes of action and despair. Oh, that's nice. For your PCs to embark upon. So, it's like these are kind of operations. All the little children. Ashes to ashes. It's like a couple, couple pages on these. As I mentioned before, there are some other... Uh, releases for this system as well. So, Keldon says they'd be using a dice rolling app for that system nowadays. Who's got time for addition? <laughs> Kabuki Kid says, Blasphemy! I've always got plenty of time for addition. That's uh, why I can still do it right off the top of my head. I can do that with. Uh, Multiplication and division and subtraction, too. <laughs> so here's our character sheet. So we've got our dexterity skills, our knowledge skills, perception skills, strength skills, willpower skills, and I'm going to guess mechanical skills for that. That's a, that's a pretty fine uh, core book there. Once again, if you want just the core book itself, 
It carries an MSRP of $39.99. We're going to slide that back into there, as well as the Game Master screen. And we've also got our punch boards and our plastic insert with all of our minis. as well as our dice and our cards. And that is what we find inside the deluxe box set for Carbon Gray role-playing game. So as I mentioned, as a bonus, we're going to take a quick peek at Badge of Blood. So this is, I believe, a solitary... Yeah, right there. It's a solo play RPG adventure. Uh, by the same authors, Andrew E.C. Gaska and E.L. Thomas. Says, no GM, no problem. In this exciting solo play adventure for the Carbon Gray role-playing game, you take on the role of an operative chosen for a death-defying mission. You'll take all your skill, cunning. It's a cunning plan, me load. And a bit of luck to pull it off. Do you have what it takes to earn your badge of blood? Or will you be just another casualty in an ever-waging war. All right. So we'll just take kind of a quick peek through here. So talking about the solitaire play. So we get our background. And as I thought we would see, we have a bit of a kind of choose your own adventure style to this with the numbered entries. So based upon what you choose to do or how well you succeed or fail at something, it'll tell you what uh, numbered entry to look to next there's that wolf artwork again all right digital janitors calling it a night thank you very much for joining us hope to see you again so it's like these are kind of the end here cool all right looks like quite a few entries this might Pick up a good amount of time to play if you're successful. Of course, if you end up buying the farm, I'm sure, I'm sure the adventure will end pretty quick. All right, there you go. So that is Badge of Blood. This is available for $24.99, or you can grab the PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $15. And of course, this is available now as well. All right, of course, I will have a review of the Carbon Gray role-playing game in the very near future. So we will be uh, diving on into that. I can tell you I'm impressed by the miniatures and the artwork in that. And as I mentioned, it's D the D6 system. So I recall that being relatively rules light. So nice. Chat says they've not played a D6 system game before, nor read this novel. The game looks really good. Not as crunchy as I thought it would be. Yeah, I was thinking it was going to probably be pretty rules heavy, seeing that it's like, you know, it's taking place during a war. Those games tend to have uh, the combat to be very crunchy. Doesn't look to be the case here. So, like I said, very curious. I'm going to take a take a deep dive into this and uh, get my review out there as soon as I can. So stay tuned. Uh, what was, oh, the other thing I was going to mention is taking a look at the miniatures. Now, granted, this box set has an MSRP of $149.99, but even if you just wanted the miniatures, that's not, it's not a bad price, especially since you had that, that big, like auto cannon or whatever it was uh, supposed to be. 
just a miniature like that would usually go for, you know, 30, 40 bucks. So, James Eck is with us in chat saying, looking forward to that review, almost hoping that it falls flat for the sake of their wallet. Well, keep in mind, you can always just get the, uh, the PDF of the rules for 20 bucks over at drive through RPG. There, like I said, there is a primer. It's either free or it's pay what you want, which effectively makes it free over at drive through RPG. You should take a peek. Stop by the gaminggang.com first, click on our banner ad, and then go to drive through RPG, search for carbon gray, and you will find that primer as well as all the other releases that are out there as well. All right, that is it for tonight. Very short week this week with the holiday on Monday. Only a couple of shows. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that we got kind of a, you know, a big extra-sized episode tonight. <laughs> got to make up for that. So if you're curious what's cooking for next week, I have changed things around a little bit because I have had some things arrive. So on Monday, we are going to unbox and take a first look at Votes for Women from Fort Circle Games. And I have heard really good things about this. I think it's solitaire. Well, no, I guess it's one to four players. Huh. Now, I had heard uh, people playing it solitaire. So, of course... It's the suffrage movement in America. And so it's a historical game. And it kind of has a little bit of a 1960 look to it. 1960 making of the president. Making of a president. I forget which it is. So, yes, this just showed up today out of the blue. I had no idea it was coming. So very excited to check this out. Also, the latest Paizo releases arrived. So, as I mentioned previously, tomorrow I'll have a, my, my monthly Paizo preview where we'll take quick looks at uh, the two adventures as well as Pathfinder Treasure Vault, which we will take a closer look at on Tuesday's show. So we will dive on into this on Tuesday's show, and then Wednesday has stayed the same. We're going to unbox and take a first look at Banish the Snakes from GMT. This is another unusual uh, topic for a board game, and I am very curious as well. So that will be next Wednesday. So lots cooking, lots going on. Uh, I have other videos which will be popping up as well. So stay tuned for those. All right, that is it for this time out. If you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, don't forget, ding that bell. Because it'll not only let you know when the dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings right here on YouTube at 7 p.m. Central. We'll also let you know when I upload other original videos, such as, as I mentioned, tomorrow's Paizo Preview. And of course, don't forget, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more that you won't find here on the YouTube channel. Come on, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. So, everybody enjoy the rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time of day it happens to be in your neck of the woods. I will be back on Monday. And here's hoping you get to enjoy plenty of great gaming. Your gang.
oh, hey, you're still here. Well, that's okay. You don't have to leave just yet. In fact, why don't you subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel right here or take a peek at the latest live stream or even find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks again for watching.